Everybody situated in? This is, uh, this is, we go from 60. You go and let me know y'all yeah, you ready. Oh, okay. Well, just uh, certainly want to take this opportunity to welcome you to Let Us Make Man, and more importantly, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to a workshop that I refer to as Making the Modern Family Work. My name is Dr. White, and much of the work I do is around restoring the black family. And my work in discussing around restoring the black family is important for you to understand that I'm not only a clinician, I'm not only an educator, um, I am also a practitioner. And when I say a practitioner, I'm not just a, uh, not just a therapist, but I'm also telling you I'm a practitioner of the black family. And so therefore, moving forward, before I do anything, I want to take in this opportunity to introduce you to my family. First, I want to introduce you to the individual that's made what I do possible um, and encourages me and actually serves as the basis for the work around the black family, and that is my wife, Dr. White, Dr. Celeste White. And I also want to introduce you to two of my three daughters. I'm a father of three daughters, and so therefore you know my position and my thing, and I stay on my game. So I want to introduce you to my middle daughter. This is Nia White. And I want to introduce you to my youngest daughter. This is Jaya Kayla White. And of course, I have one more daughter. She's a sophomore at Spelman College. Uh, her name is Imani White, but I've changed her name to Daddy I Need. So give it a hand up for Daddy I Need. I'm absolutely excited that you all thought enough to take this opportunity to come to my workshop. You notice when you first came in, I gave you an assignment. And what that assignment was is to answer some basic questions that are on the wall. That is, we're going to get to understanding our own family relationships and family dynamics. And I do this so that you can see when I say it and when I put those dots up and we get to it, you will see it. So the work that we're going to do is around restoring and strengthening the black family. So when I say restore and strengthen, that means restore simply means to give back, to return, to put back into its original form. And so why is that so important? Because a lot of times when we think about the black family, or we even try to understand the black family, there's always this need to immediately take us back to Africa and talk about as if Africa was our, I mean, excuse me, back to slavery, as if slavery was our beginning point. And so slavery was certainly not our beginning point. So we start to look at understanding our origins of who we are. So we talk about restoring the black family and putting back. What we're doing is literally going back and understanding the black family within the context of the birth of the civilization. So you see here, Ramses and Nefertari. You see Asura Set and Haru. These are the black families and black images. But what I also want you to pay attention to when you look at these images, you will notice the erosions of the noses. You'll notice the erosions of the arms where they're connected and talk. Because this here challenges the notion of what we've been taught nowadays as if the woman is behind the man. So we become accustomed to the concept that behind every strong man is what? A strong black woman. And that's what they taught us, is that the black woman belongs behind us as if she's a shadow. But you see here, in contest to these images, they blow or really put the black woman behind. But she's really by our side. And that is how you really maintain balance, not front to back, but side to side. This here is the image of the black family that we want you to wrap your hands around. So when we're talking about the restoration, we're talking about understanding that they build dynasties for their wives, for their daughters, for the women. That is how we honor those who gave birth and bring forth civilization. Does that make sense? Yes. And so we continue to look then from then to getting to the point of slavery and actually taking a moment to really recognize it within a historical perspective in terms of how it has impacted the black family. And one of these pictures you're looking at right now is an amazing photo because it is a, a depiction of a slave auction where you have a family that is being auctioned off right now. As sad as it is, when you see the father, the mother, and the two children holding their children, this here is recognizing that the marriage and family ties were broken. They were never recognized. And this, I'm going to show you soon, has had an impact in our lives on today. 
And so we begin to look here. Over 32% of the marriages were dissolved, dissolved and removed, not recognizing. And what did it look like? You may have been taught that when this thing happened, it was this passive peace, but it wasn't. We recognize that the impact of the slavery and the dynamics taking place. But you must understand that when you look at how the black family and its impact on the slavery occurred, you'll see here in this auction, you see the man at the top auctioning off the newborn child. You see the mother. What is the mother doing? Begging. She's begging and pleading. And more importantly, look at the father. What is happening to the father right now? They beat him. That means it's going to help you understand that this breakup did not passively occur. It's designed to help you understand that there was no protection for our families and children, but it was also important for you to understand when they moved toward the breakup of the black family, this had a massive psychological as well as emotional and physiological impact on the black family. But in spite of it all, we do recognize when you look at some of your grandparents' pictures, when you look at some of the old pictures in your family, you see that we managed to use the Clark Atlanta University uh, alma mater term, find a way to make one. Granddaddy and grandmama found a way to make it happen. Had nothing to do with the financial stability of the family. It said that we will make it, and that's why we opened up this workshop with um, a family reunion. We open up with Angie Stone, Black Brother. We open up with Unbreakable because these are some of the tenets that are so critical about the Black family. And so you look at it as we begin to move that the Freedmen's Bureau study of 2,888 slaves following the end, moving towards the end of slavery, how rapidly families began to marry and to reconnect. Mississippi immediately 1,225, Tennessee 1,123, <coughs> Louisiana 540. This is down in the south. So this process became absolutely critical. What does that tell us? That tells us that towards the end of slavery, in one of my favorite images, towards the end of slavery, we learned something. We learned that as soon as those fathers and those husbands and those men had an opportunity towards the end of uh, the Civil War where the army is still matching. Daddy actually mounted up his horse and he began to go from plantation to plantation finding his family. Plantation to plantation in search and finding his family. So you got daddy, you got daddy looking forward. You got mama, she's looking back. You got the son looking immediately, looking down, and mom's even holding an infant child. Imagine if in 2014, fathers mounted up and went from community to community to find their children and to reconnect, to gain that progress that is needed. And so this is why we work to understand the impact of, of the black family, the impact of ending slavery, but you have to understand that since then, there's still yet some work we have to do. We have to begin the process of reconnecting the family. Now, I just told you what the master does. We told you that he separated and made it difficult to find the family. Well, let's see if this is an issue that still exists today. In front of you all, there's something called the family tree. Here's your assignment. I want you all to take this family tree, and when I say go, I want you to fill it out as best as possible. Everybody got a pen? When I say go, I want you to fill it out. Now here are the ground rules. Here are the ground rules to completing the family tree. On the bottom is you. To the left is always the father, <coughs> and to the right is always the mother. So therefore, if this is you, you go up, this will be the mother, and if you go up, this will be your grandfather and your grandmother. And if you go up on your grandfather's side, this will be your great-grandfather, your great-grandmother. On your father's side, it's your great-grandfather, your great-grandmother, on your mother's side. So when I say go, I want you all to take the opportunity to complete that family tree as fast as you can. I'm going to give you all ready, set, go. Consider that tree. 
Now, please make sure you put your name on the bottom, because that's you. And if you don't know, that's you. Dr. Christopher Bass is conducting a mental health workshop down the hall. <laughs> Get down there so you can figure out who you are, what you find yourself, and you come on back down here, and we, we work that out. But if you pass that, go on up. You may have a nickname and not have the actual name. That's okay. Take the time. Good progress. You going? All right. I mean, everybody look up. We're going to keep going. I want you to keep working on it. But let's see who wants to go. Who wants to take a shot? Who wants to take a shot? I'm going to start with you. Give me a name, Mr. Kinte. Mr. Kinte. Who was that? That's me. What's your name? Kinte. Kinte what? Allah. Kinte Allah, okay. Kinte. Who is this? That is Joseph. That's your father. And who is this? My brother. What's the name? Mary. Mary, which way do you want to go? Uh, go with Joseph. This is like Jeopardy. I'll take Jer Joseph for 200, please. Okay. <laughs> All right, on Joseph, who you got to the left? Your uh, grandfather. Uh, don't know? All right, put a question mark. If you don't know, just put a question mark next to it. And to the right, who was that? Uh, Lucille. Lucille, okay. Let's try your mother's side. To the left, who was that? Uh, I don't know. Question mark A to the right. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so therefore these are blanks. Yeah. Okay, anybody else going to take a shot? Give them a hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyone else going to take a shot? What you got? Give me your name. Charles. Charles. Okay, Charles. who you got? Father Lynn Otto. Okay. Mother Ruth. Okay. Her father John. John. Uh, her mother Priscilla. Her mother Priscilla, okay. And that's it? Yes. Okay. okay, good. Give him a hand. All right, good. One more. Yes, sir. Uh, Alex on the bottom. Alex on the bottom. That's you? Yes, sir. Okay, to the left. My mother, Easter. Okay, Easter. Uh, my grandparents, Vaster and Essie. Vaster here and Essie? Yes, sir. Okay. And then to the right, uh, Sam and Easter. Sam and Easter, okay. Top. Okay. And then I can go. I can go to the top of that, and that's it. Okay, where you want to go? Um, top, well, you don't have it there, but above Sand, uh, above Easter, I can go. Um, right here? Up here? Yeah, floor. Why you skip my house on the boat? Huh? You got, what? Oh, you got this your grandparents. Who was that? Right, my, grand, my grandmother, Essie and Vass, that's what I had. Okay, now you want to go with Essie? That's my grandmother. Okay, that's your grandmother. And then her, her here? parents, that's oh. what I apologize for. Sam and Easter. Sam and Easter, give them a hand. All the way up the top. And you got a question mark for the others, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, isn't this amazing? This is why I always make the point about the impact of slavery in 2014. We still have a lot of empty boxes. Let me take one of the young guys. I want y'all to take a shot. What you got? Uh, Go ahead. Start with you. Give me a full name. Kristen Williams. Mr. Williams? All right, who you got? Ernest? Mm -hmm. Ernest and Christy, okay. What you got next? Uh, for my father, I have Thurston Bernard. Thurston Bernard? Yeah, and Willie May. And Willie May? Yes, yes sir. Okay. And my mom, uh, Annie Laura. Uh-huh. And uh, I never met my mom. Put a question mark there. That's okay. It's there. All right. And <laughs> I got it. That's okay. Give me the name. You, this is my mom, Papa. Well, give my hand. That's all right. That's all right. We call them Big Daddy and Big Mama. Yes, Mama, Patient, Papa, Frank, right? So as you get older, the names do change. But here is the point. When people start questioning whether or not the existence of slavery is still there, I get to tell you yes. Because we are still in the process of connecting. The only difference is we're no longer mounting up the horse. And in this regard, I'm saying we're actually no longer having the conversation. Imagine if your family and your parents are still alive and you start asking the question, who is this? Who is that? When you find these pictures and you're asking, who is this? Who is that? You're putting names to them. Here's one of the challenges associated with that. It's because th what happened to us in slavery actually happens to us today in terms of what the master did, and here's what I mean. What the master did is that he severed, his, he severed that family relationship, right? Well, guess what? 
When you have a horrible relationship with your father, or you have a horrible relationship with your parents, and then you declare, I don't want to have anything else to do with them, right? Now you have children, right? Well, here's the challenge when you have children, because you now no longer have anything to do with your children. Suddenly now your children know not their grandparents. So therefore, when your children have children, they reach the point they say, well, I can only go to the last person or last level of the family that gave us information. And that's really what happens to us in developing the family tree. We can actually go as far as the information that we were given. But part of that is that we stop asking. We stop mounting the horse. So one of your assignments when you look at making the modern family worker or, and restoring the black family, one of your assignments is to start asking questions. Because if you have children and they don't have the information, the making of a family secret is that when the children learn, though you've never said anything, but everything about your behavior says don't ask. And so guess what? They don't ask. And so that's what we have a lot of times with our children. So we begin to see and understand we have to do some work in terms of understanding the type of families that we have, the dynamics. We've been taught that somehow the black family is broken because you no longer have a husband and a wife and the 2.5 children and any constellation of the black family that's not husband and father a husband and wife and 2.5 children, it's a broken family. But I'm going to tell you that families come in all shapes and sizes. And here's what I mean. How many of you growing up at one point in your life had a family member live with y'all other than your, your parents? You see that? That's an extended family. How many at one point growing up at some point Y'all stay at some of your family members' house for some period of time. Because that was what is characteristic of the black family. And many times, you may also see the grandmother who emerges to actually take on the role of the primary parent. And so that's why you have some children that say, well, we call my grandmother mama. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I have my mama, but we call my grandmother mama. Or we call my grandfather papa. So we have to understand the different dynamics of the family. Now, one of our challenges is that we have this internal or experiential understanding of the black family. But then we recognize that the media tries to inform us in terms of the images of the black family, in terms of what we see, or the, the Braxtons and the, and the House of Pain and all these other images that are trying to <coughs> articulate to us today what the black family looks like. But you know, these images and understanding the black family today, we had them when we were growing up. It was a whole entirely different generation. Consider the black family in the 70s. And the music and the songs of the 70s. Who remembers this show? Family what? Matters. Family what? Matters. Matters. So the name of the movie, the show was called Family what? Matters. Matters. So it was in the song, and it was in the title, and what do you see in that family? A father. A father. So we had Family Matters. We also had other shows <coughs> where people lived in the projects and things that we call. Who remembers the name of this? 227. Room 227. Absolutely. And even in all the struggle, what did we see in room 227? Where was he? Absolutely. Still the daddy. And he was doing what? He was still working. He was still working and running things. These were the images that we got growing up. And even coming through a little bit more, we went to the 80s and the 90s, there were other families that began to take place. The songs and the name of it as well. So what was the name of this sitcom? Good Times? And, and who was that? James. That was James, James. James Evans. Absolutely. Now think about this. Think about not only the title of this, but do you remember the message that was in the song when it came on? It said, just looking out of the window. Help me out. Watching the asphalt flow. Come on. Thinking how it all looks handy down. Come on. Good time. Come on. Keeping your head above water. Here we go. Making a way when you can. To the rain layoffs. Good time. Easy 
credit reform. Good times. Scratching their surviving. Good times. Hanging in the dotted. Good times. Good times. We know. Ain't we lucky we got them. So come on, y'all. Good times. Absolutely. Yeah. Good times. That was the message in the song. And so we understood that even in the project, in Cabrini Green, we understood that <coughs> even within poverty, we still managed to have good times. And equally important, there was daddy home. Yeah. So that meant that in spite of the financial struggles of the project, daddy was still where? Home. Daddy was still home. So we understand that that means that during these times, the shows were in sync with the messages that we were trying to convey. And so therefore, when they continued to move, the shows began to even educate us of when the black family began to succeed. Right. So you go daddy from working in the dry cleaner to ultimately <coughs> owning a, a chain of dry cleaners. And when he finally signed that lease, and he got it and told his wife, I got it, I got that chain, pack everything up, something began to happen. The little kid looked at him and said, well, what's going on now? And Mama turned to her, y'all ready for this? And she said, oh, well, we're moving on up, moving on up to, to the east, east side. side. Come on. To, to that deluxe apartment in the sky. Come on. Move, moving on up, going up to the east side. Here we go. We finally got a piece of the pie. Here we go. Come on, y'all. Here we go. Fist don't, Fist don't fry in the kitchen. Here we go. Bees don't burn on the grill. Took a whole lot of trying just to get up out here. Here we go. Now we love in the big leagues. Here we go. Getting our turn at best. Here we go. As long as you live, and you and me, baby, ain't nothing wrong with that. Oh, well, we're moving on up. Give yourself a hand. Absolutely. It was in the song. It is my point about the black family with the images and the shows were in sync with our values. That meant that they respected and understood and we conveyed the values of the black family. So when I ask you all about if any of you had a situation where you found yourself living with someone at a certain period of time, that meant for some of us, you got to be so bad that they made their mind up saying, you know what, I'm going to send you away to your uncle. I'm going to send you away to your aunt. Amen. And so therefore, all of a sudden, kid outside getting into a fight, and then the mama breaks out. I mean, the son breaks out. He starts to tell how he ended up in their land. Mm -hmm. Y'all got to help me out. Can y'all help me out? This is a story. He said, in West Philadelphia, I'm born and raised on the playground where I spend most of my days. Then a couple of kids, they were up to no good. They started making trouble in my neighborhood. I got into one little fight. She said, to move over to IT and up to the building. Kids over here, absolutely. We understood that. So, in that simple show, helped us understood about the concept of sending your children when you were trying to do it, but you, you were that rambunctious, they understood, I'm going to send you to a family member, to an uncle, who's going to get your butt in check. Mm -hmm. So this is when all the different dynamics of the black family were at play. We understood. But even in spite of that, there still were psychological traumas that impacted us as a black family. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that when this show came out, what's the name of that show? Cosby Show. That's right. When the Cosby Show came out, what was the problem? Black America, we struggled with this concept. Y'all remember that? Yeah. What were we saying about this? It was not realistic. What else? Why not? Because you had two professional people, uh -huh. high-end professional people. Two high-end professional That wasn't realistic. And a position. Uh-huh. You got kids going to college. Kids going to college. All this stuff was just ridiculous. All this stuff is it was just too good for you. What else did y'all learn about the, what else was our issue? Maybe not yours, but what else were we saying about this? Well, I, I'm just going to say, it just depends on where, on where you live. Because okay. 
I think that really exists in real life. Maybe just not a whole lot. But well, you, you know what? And you're absolutely right. It yeah. did exist. Yeah. The most amazing thing is when we talk about the psychic trauma or the psychological impact of slavery, it was us, not white America, right. who was struggling with the concept right. that the daddy was a doctor and the mother was a lawyer. Struggling with the concept that daddy didn't have to beat the kids, but he sat the son down and said, let's talk. We were trained, and so we struggled with this concept. We actually, many of us in 2014, still refused to buy it. But, but there was, what I saw on there, there was lots of dysfunctionality. Absolutely. At least on AIDS care. Absolutely. The, I mean, there was the right. totally off. Right. Yeah. There was dysfunction in the family. Yeah. They didn't hide the dysfunction in the family, but it right. wasn't the dysfunction in the family that we struggled with. It was the function of the family that we struggled with. Uh, Just so. the basic notion that the family exists. So if I try to tell someone that, yes, I have a PhD, my wife has a PhD, yes, I have a daughter in college, yes, I have children in the magnet program, we are a figment of your imagination. So what do you think the impact when we had the first black president and his family, this man with his two daughters? This is what we find ourselves realizing in dealing with the, the impact of the black family. We still, to this day, struggle with it. But that's how critical and important the work was. But these messages and these images through the 70s and the 90s, it communicated and educated us in terms of images and portrayals of the black man. <coughs> this is not the media that takes place today. So we've done the family tree. Now I want to do something with you all. What I want to do with you all, I need everybody to stand up. Because there's another attribute and element of the black family, and that involves understanding our family values. Now, here's what's going to happen. I think you all move over this way. Everybody move toward the middle. I'm going to read a statement. And if you agree with that statement, I want you to go to the right. If you disagree with that statement, I want you to go to the left. If you're neutral, stay right in the middle. Y'all ready? Here's the first question. Men should always pay for the first date. If you agree, go to the side. If you disagree, go to the side. Men should always pay for the first date. Men should always pay for the first date. Agree, disagree, neutral. Now, let me look at this here. Now, we always see this formation. Agree, disagree, neutral. So y'all agree, men should pay for the first date. Why is that? You want to impress her. Okay, why is that? Why should men pay for the first date? Why do you agree with that? It's basically what she's expecting. It's what she's expecting. Now you disagree. You saying I don't think men should always pay for the first date. Why is that? Because it, it makes it make it unbalanced. It should be even even kill. Even kill, what does that mean? It should be it should be even. It shouldn't be like he should pay or she should pay. It should be like whoever will agree on. Whoever agree on it, okay. And now, if you hear something that you kind of agree with, feel free to move. You're neutral. What, why are you neutral? Because it's a first date. You don't really know one another that well, and no one should be responsible for the other person's meal. You should be responsible for yourself. Oh, uh, okay, on the first day. All right, now, now you are, your, your whole face has changed five different shapes. <laughs> <laughs> why is that? I, I believe the man asked the woman out. It's okay. his responsibility. Secondly, if that date, if, when you ask someone out on a date, I'm assuming you're looking for something long term. And to establish that you, and not being a show as, as a man, that you're going to protect her and take care of her, you start it off right. And start it off right means paying for the first date? Well, you're paying for a meal, yeah. Okay, all right, y'all, pretty good. Give yourself a hand. Everybody move towards the middle. All right, here's the next question. Y'all ready for me? The next question is this A man that cries easily is weak. A man that cries easily is weak. If you agree, go to this side. If you disagree, go to this side. I have no neutral. <laughs> I knew it. Some of y'all get that neutral. You got a neutral look about yourself. A man that cries easily, you agree this side. You disagree this side. Now, I'm going to come over here and stand by this young man. Not because I necessarily agree with him, but here's what I do realize, that I have been known to be the only person right in the room for the wrong people. 
But I've also been known to be the only person wrong with us in a room full of right people. But what's most important is that I'm willing to take a stand regardless of what the room of people says. So that's why I'm over here. Now you tell me, when I raise that question, why do you agree? A man should cry. I said, a man that cries easily is weak. Why do you agree that if a man cries easily, he's weak? Emotional problem, he ain't got his priorities together if a man is crying easily. Okay, now you all over here disagree. Why do you disagree? Um, I think, you know, a person that cries, they in touch with their emotions. They, you know, Sometimes stuff will make you cry. Crying makes you feel better. You know, okay. you know it hurts you more than it do that, I, that pain. You know, sometimes there's a whole lot of pain. Crying makes you feel better. Okay, and I say the man that cries easily is weak. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that where the world is, is easy to cry. You can easily cry in this world. He's not gonna cry, but he's as much. He was extra. I mean, he uh -huh. say much. That, that might be a little bit. Okay. I, I, I didn't. I wasn't focusing too much on the easy part. You're not ready to move. You're gonna stay over there, all right? But, uh, yeah. Okay. He's gonna stay over there. Okay. You heard anybody hear anything you want to leave? I said easily. Y'all good? good? Okay. Good. Get in the middle. Here we go again. We're looking at these family values and understanding these family values. These are the things that go from generation to generation. Here comes the next question. You ready? Birth control is primarily the woman's responsibility. If you agree, go to this side. If you disagree, go to this side. Birth control is primarily the woman's responsibility. <laughs> no one come over here and stand by this man over here. <laughs> no, hold on now. We got to hear. He's agreeing that birth control is primarily the woman's responsibility. Why is that? Um, because she controls her body. So I'm saying, like, she's on birth control. She knows about her body. Okay. All right. All right, over here, why do you disagree? You disagree that I do not agree that birth control is a woman's primary responsibility. Why is that? It's basically not just birth control, but you can use other countries. Okay, all right, okay. Stay right there, stay right there. I'm gonna read this next question. When it comes to giving birth, imagine the woman's pregnant. When it comes to giving birth, the man has just as much say so as the woman as to whether or not that child should come forward or not. You agree? Come over here. You disagree? Stand over there. Ah. I'm going to say that again. I said the man has just as much say so as the woman as to whether or not they should have that child if she's pregnant. Agree? If you agree over here, the man has just as much say so as the woman. If you disagree, you come over there. All right. We didn't cause some movement. Now, why you disagree? I think, I'm thinking in medical terms. I, as a man, I don't understand what she's going through. And okay. there, may be, there may be, you know, some serious thing, you know, life of the child versus life of the mother. So I'm, I'm looking at it from a medical standpoint. Okay. I'm considering her. All right. He considering her. All right. Now y'all just y'all over here. You agree, right? You man, I just must say so. Why is that? I believe so. I'm thinking as far as really the the aspect of really if she does not want it. Okay. I said just as much say so. You agree? Yeah. All right. Give him a hand, y'all. Give him a hand. Here, everybody take a seat. We do that activity in understanding the black family because we also have to understand the family values and understanding those values and how they move through. One of the things, not only the values, our traditions and behaviors go from generation to generation. And I'm going to introduce you to something called the genogram. And here's what it is. It is a family tree that comes to life. And what I mean by that is that it creates an opportunity where you see patterns and trends that exist in our family. So it's called a family tree, but here we're talking about the genogram and looking at those relationships. Now, these are some fundamental symbols that we start to see. One, when you see a square, you always know that that's the male. You see a circle, that's the female. Now, we're going to do something with this in a second, so y'all got to pay attention real close. Now, when you see a man and a woman together and there's a solid line, that means that they married. You got it? Now, if you see a man and woman together and they're dotted lines, that means that they're living together, but they're not married. Right? They're in a relationship, but they're not married. Now, when you see a situation where there's a single line, that means they're separated. Y'all with me? I'm going to educate y'all very quickly. 
Now we see them together and there's a double line. That means that they are divorced. These are some, some fundamental symbols that we see. And watch what happens when we bring this together. There are some other symbols that I want you to take a quick look at too. Whenever a, a, an X through a square or circle, it means a dead, a, a triangle is pregnant. The drug abuse means that one of the lines are shaped. We're going to do something with this in a second. You see it in your book as well. What page is that on? You see it in your book. Substance abuse, page 13, 13 and 14. Now, watch this. Now, watch how this works. Now, you all completed some lines on, your, on, your, um, on the wall, and I want you all to take a look at something very quickly. Now, here's a man, and there's a woman, and they've gotten together, dotted line, and they have a child together. Y'all got me? Now, when you look at this man and woman together, they got the child together, but the man has gotten married, but not to the woman they had the child together. And they've been married 20 years. They also have a child. Now, one of the things you're going to notice immediately is that they've been married 20 years. That means that they got married the same year he had the child by the other woman. Y'all see that? <coughs> see it? Follow along. It's very interesting. So two years after they married, they have a child because that child is 18 years old. Right? So this is where a family happens and they have another child that's 14-year-old, and then yet they have another child. Keep on looking at it. Now suddenly these kids are happy. That man did what? He didn't have another child, another woman outside, and they didn't did what? They didn't have another child. That means that he didn't have another outside child. This is the way the dynamic of the family works. And so obviously that causes strain in their relationship. You see that? But even in the midst of that strain, they did what? They, they still had another child. You're absolutely right. And so I'm mad at you, but I ain't that kind of mad at you. <laughs> but they're still together and they're working it out. So the mom said it's okay, we're good for the goose. I want to introduce y'all to Gander. There's Gander over there. In green. Uh -huh. And so what do you think that automatically did? Caused a strain and oh, Lord have mercy, what has happened? She had a baby. She then went off and had another child too, 10 years old. So these become some of the dynamics and family patterns that we see, which ultimately results in them getting a what? A divorce. You know what? Y'all wanted to do a Jenna Brown just like that. You follow along. So when you look at these images here, and five years later, here's where the dynamics begin to kick in. Everybody's at their respective ages. Now, suddenly, what has happened to daddy? He's got a what? A substance abuse problem. We started to look at daddy. And, boy, how is all the dynamic going on? Somebody's going to get a substance abuse going on. But guess what? Now, the child got a substance abuse issue, too. You see it? Suspected substance abuse. Not fully say it. But now, remember that daughter over there, 25? What did she do? Did? She didn't have a baby. She didn't have how many? Two children by two different men. This is where the dynamics. That son, he got married and they had what? They had twins, absolutely. You see the relationships taking place? But yet they ended up being what? Separated. All y'all doing absolutely. Wonderful. Now, all of a sudden, that daughter has been got what? Pregnant. Pregnant. Oh, well, now what's going to happen to that other, that other woman? She done got a mental health issue. This is where those dynamics begin to carry out when we look at them in the black family. And so you can follow and trace these. So one of your assignments in the family is your assignment to start asking questions. This is actually how family secrets begin to kick in. Because we start, we don't ask certain questions about our family members. We simply don't. It becomes embarrassing. But these dynamics, when you move forward and you see it in your book, you take those diagrams in your book and you start mapping out the same thing with your family. So you can understand what they begin to look like with children in foster care, mental health issues, and things of that regard. And so it even helps you understand some of the substance abuse issues. So you see it laid out. These are all the things that are critical in making the modern family work. So when we're looking at the black family and the lessons that we learn from the family tree, from the uh, genograms, is that we have to start asking questions. We have to look at family patterns. 
When you start asking questions, there are going to be some new discoveries, gentlemen, ladies. <coughs> you have to understand how your family fits. You have to be comfortable enough and bold enough to actually ask the questions about your family, even when you have children. That's why we tell you to interview your elders. <coughs> Daddy got children on the other side of town. We never knew anything about them, you, but guess what? And so, but you need to get to understand. You get, you need to get to know who they are. Because as I said again, once you sever a relationship with someone above you, all the generations behind you are suddenly severed. That's how powerful that is. So you think you're making an individual decision, but you're making a decision that affects generations to come. We know that if you want to challenge me, my answer is going to be for you to hold up your family tree. And to say to yourself, why is it that I couldn't go on with your time? So that's why we began that work to try to understand and ask the difficult questions and ask the uncomfortable questions. It's critical that you learn to ask those difficult and uncomfortable questions. Yes. That's a very interesting question. The question was raised, what if you ask the question but you can't handle the answer? The truth. And that's a very serious piece because that, that ability to handle the answer is where the family secrets come in. Imagine you saying, Mama, how come me and my brother, or Daddy, how come me and my brother look so much alike? Hmm. And imagine if the answer was because your brother is my brother's, your, your, your brother, father, is my brother. How do you handle that? So one of the challenges when you begin to ask questions, it means that you have to be prepared and get yourself in the right mind to be ready to answer. What is it that you have to ask yourself some basic questions? What is it that I want to hear? What is it that I'm afraid to hear? Do I have some follow-up questions associated with it? So we have to begin to kind of look at what some of those issues are. Now these patterns and trends are very serious because we educate ourselves even when you reach the point of looking at some of the questions and how you responded to them actually on the wall. And so take a look at some of these questions. Take a look at some of the questions that we have up here. And you'll look and see how we begin to respond to some of these questions. I said, what are your views about relationships? And we start understanding some of the views about relationships. And I asked some other questions as well. And we're going to see how we responded to these questions. I asked, how old are you? Many of you said you're over 43. How many brothers and sisters do you have? A number of you said you had at least two brothers and sisters. I asked you, were you married? You were kind of split in your marital status. I asked you then about your views about relationships. People should be together before marriage. And many of you pretty much agree. I said most women, most men only want one thing. And y'all say false. You know why so many people say false? Because there's a bunch of men in this room. <laughs> maybe I should have said, maybe I should have said most men want more than one thing. I don't know. Can men and women just be friends? Look at this. Almost right down the middle. Yeah? No. Yeah? And somebody would put a dot right on the line. It depends. <laughs> and guess what? We began to look at that relationship dynamic, and I said, do you know someone in a domestic violence relationship? And many of you said, yes. I do know someone in domestic violence relationship. And so we began to ask some other simple questions. And we looked at some of these questions earlier, and you're going to be absolutely amazed at what we discovered. When I turned around and said, tell me about your family background, look at some of the dynamics that we ended up seeing. Number one, how many brothers and sisters you had? A lot of you said you had three to four or five or six brothers and sisters. And then I asked, did you grow up with your brothers and sisters? A lot of you said, yes, I grew up with my brothers and sisters. And then I said, did you all have the same mother and father, and what did we get? 
The majority said, no, I did not have the same mother and father. And so we start looking at these, we look at these uh, uh, um, relationships here, and we ask, tell me about your parents' marriage, marital status. Remember that family tree? And many of you said, yes, my parents were married. And then I ask you, how would you describe your parents' relationship? And what did they say? Mostly what? Mostly positive. Now watch this. Every workshop, every time I ask this type of question, people tell me that their parents' relationship was mostly positive. So then when I turn around and say, well, do you want a relationship like your parents? And what does everybody say? No. Heck no. no. <laughs> now why is it mostly they're married, mostly positive, but nobody wants a relationship like it? Why is that? Anyone want to take a shot? I think it's just a part of it. Okay, it's important not being married. Why do you think so? people say it's mostly positive, but I don't want a relationship like that? Why is that? I think, I think it's generational it's conditional. Because okay. we, live, we live in different times now. Okay. I, th I think that's really what my basis is. Okay. All right, so, all right, good. You've got to have some more stuff for me. Just, you know. And it's so interesting because I asked the men in the room then, would you want a daughter to, uh, would you want a daughter, uh, I asked the people in the room, would you want uh, your daughter to be like her mother? And we get a lot of men saying, yes, I want my daughter to be like her mother. And then I turn around and ask, would you want your son to be like his father? That would be you. And a lot of you said, yes, I do. And then I ask the man, as a male, would you like to be like your father? And then you split down the middle. So one of the critical dynamics is that there's a lot that we're learning and we see. There's a lot that we're taking from our parents. But there's a whole lot that our parents can keep. Yep. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. And so guess what? Our task in making the modern family work, when we have children, we have to have our, help our children decide to keep more <coughs> of what they learn from you than they leave behind. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have to understand that dynamic. And so we have to begin that process by looking at our concepts of relationships. How do you end up with that many single or unmarried or divorced relationships? And a lot of times it has a lot to do with what we call the dating game. It has a lot to do with these dynamics here. The deinstitutionalization of marriage. That means there was a time with this concept of courting that we held it high and we recognized it, that now we run into a point that there is no courting. Have you ever heard of courting before? Is courting still alive? Is it still real? Huh? According is not hip no more. But you know, there's a <laughs> dynamic. And I think it does, does go on, but that's another different interpretation. It goes on. Well, you're right. But you know what? There's some values, though, that still exist. Watch this. All the men stand up in the room right quick. Watch this, Watch this dating dynamic that still exists. Here's my question. Men, did you behave differently if the young lady, how she was going over visit, did you behave differently if she, if there was a father there? Raise your hand if you behaved differently if there was a daddy there. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you behaved differently if, if, she, if a father was there. Mm -hmm. Look at that dynamic. Why is that? Why did you behave differently if a father there? Why? There's an expectation that you better, you better somehow come close to it. Uh, an There's expectation, there. absolutely. Why do we behave differently when a father's there? Being honest, because you don't want to get your head bashed near. You don't want to, that's right. There's a dynamic that come with it. Why would you behave differently? You don't want to get shot. You don't want to get shot. Y'all hear this stuff all the time. Why would why you behave differently? In my case, the pastor. Oh, he was dating the pastor's wife. Oh, them the freakies. I mean, he was a pastor. He dated the pastor's daughter. Yeah, you had to ask him that right. Have a seat. Now, let me turn around and ask this question here, gentlemen. Imagine, if you will, your daughter's at home and the, the young guy's going to her house. Now, what happened if he pulled up to your house and do this? Ba, ba, ba. He blow the horn. Click, click. Oh, I'm sorry. He said, click, click. Is there a problem with that? He done blew the horn. What's wrong with that? It's kind of. I, I want to say kind of disrespectful. It's kind of too loud. It's, um, it's <laughs> in, in, inappropriate. <laughs> Are you going to let your daughter go outside? No. 
Why not? Now, isn't this amazing? When we look at that, I want you all to pay attention to this, this dynamic. All these high values that you have regarding this daughter in these rooms. Absolutely. That means a horn and blow out that thing when I'm doing a horn for my daughter, you stay right where you at. I'm gonna go outside and have a cup of water to ever blow the horn, right? But isn't this amazing? How many of y'all didn't blow the horn for her to come out? If you think about all the things and the interactions that you've had with the women, how many of you of these values that you hold high? How many of these values were different, meaning you engaged in them differently? But that's okay, because when I was a child, I thought of the child, I did those childish things, right? That's right. So you don't have to hide behind the fact that some of the things that you hold high as a value right now that you engaged in as a child. Does that make sense? But we have to look at these relationships and these dynamics here. We see now the notion of relationships have changed. A lot of times the problem in the, the politics of the dating is this. We think we are one place in this relationship, but the other person is somewhere totally different. Yeah. So in this regard, here's a young man thinking that he's body in love and asked to pop the big question. What is she saying, somebody? <laughs> hold on. Hold on now. Hold on. Hold on. She said, wait a minute, this is more than what I thought. Uh, I want to play the game a little bit. His nose is completely <laughs> parallel. So we have to understand that hmm. dynamic. African-American men and women are significantly more likely to have children by more than one partner. 80% of African-American men compared to 40% of white, 78% of African-American mothers compared to 46% of white. We are engaged in these relationships. We're actually, actually having children as well. But these relationships are not lasting. And so it becomes important to understand the dynamic that we're engaged in. But the media, if we're not careful, because the media nowadays has gotten completely out of sync. Now, y'all just had that great discussion and dialogue, and y'all sang all the songs, but this is what they're trying to do in 2013. They came out with a show, Rafi Shorty Love. And they were going to have a show on called All My Baby's Mamas. This never made it to the air. He got taken off before it got put up. But the fact that they had already piloted several episodes of it. The fact that they had already started advertising for it simply means that the media, who is now out of sync with our values as a people, the media was trying to see how far they can go, and we remain blind. And so these dynamics push us back and take it off the air, but we've done it. They're not immune in terms of what we see. We saw our revolution, the sexual revolution, and, and what some of y'all did in the 60s and 70s. We saw that whole dynamic take place. But in 2014, the images of the black family, now you see this big push about the black woman. Now they're pushing to make her an angry black woman. They're pushing now for the image that you see of the black male is that they all locked up. Ergo, we now have the concept that ain't no good man out there, because they all locked up. When we look at the angry black woman, not only is she angry, she's un emotionally unstable. And so you begin to hear men and say, you know what, I'm down with the black women, because you know, the sisters, when the sisters get upset, they get to, and we buy into that whole concept, which is amazing, because they'll say it was a sister that gave birth to them. But we have to study these dynamics. The thugs and all these negative images that we have. And in 2013, not only did we see that, we also saw these other movies, Real Housewives of Atlanta. <laughs> the further, and what we're saying is that we've understood and studied the attack of the black man for generations and generations, and I'm now telling you that there's an attack <coughs> on the black woman. And the media is engaged in this. We have been taught and trained to protect our black women, but I'm telling you right now, there's a media attack and a portrayal of it, gossip game. These are some of the images that they're, 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 they're beginning to teach us. And even some of our black women and our women who are engaged to me medical, uh, successful men and women, they're now telling you, married to medicine, and they're looking at the dysfunction of women who are married to medical doctors. These are the images that I'm communicating to you all 
about the attack of the black woman. So we have to, yes, as black men, we, we must not only continue to engage and to save just one as we do here at Let Us Make Man, but I'm also telling you that the black woman is under attack as well through the media. And guess what? Even through our rap. A lot of times it is through the communication and the media images of the rap music that gives a reality show its permission to do what it does. And so that's where our push and our challenges are to begin to look at them. Now, here's our piece. We have to understand the relationships and how we get to them. And so I ask the question, what makes a man initially appealing? What makes a woman initially appealing? We're talking about those things that attract people today. It is a thing that makes us appealing. I'm going to tell you right now the way it's taught in the media is that we, are learned, we have learned that men only want one thing, is what, and that's what? Sex. Men only want one thing, and the one thing men want is sex. And so what do men do to get what they want? They got to have a lot of what? Bling, bling. They got to have a lot of money and bling bling. And guess what? You can be a brother making A's and B's, trying to compete <laughs> against a brother making C's and D's, but driving a BMW. Well, who got the greater probability of getting the date? The A's and B's and the B and the W? BMW. The BMW. So this become our challenge. Does that mean your nerds and your young people got a lot, a lot of competition? And guess what? They say women only want one thing, and what's that? Money. And so what does the media teach our women to do? It teaches us to be as flirtatious and as half-naked and as appealing as possible. And guess what? If she does it right, songs like throw it in the bag. Songs like she's got all these things that they need. We begin to see that, right? We glorify the way women and what they will get if they can do what they say that they can do. <coughs> yes? When you also say it's at home is a danger because you got the single black mother there. And when she has a daughter, she first thing she'll tell her daughter is, don't go, you know, he's not good enough for her if he doesn't make any money. Then if she has a son, then regardless who the girl is, she's never good enough for her son. And she causes a division. Well, absolutely. A couple of things, and it's, it's a dynamic that goes both ways. You hear about love, mothers who love their sons um, and, and raise their daughters. Juwanza mm -hmm. Kajuku talked about that way in the 80s. We love our sons and raise our daughters. And guess what? There's this concept sometimes, I almost call it the Jesus syndrome. There's this concept, sometimes mothers can love their sons so much that we have to ask the question, how does a single mother produce a male chauvinist son? Well, I'm going to tell you how it's done. It's very simple. It starts when he's very, very small. When he's very, very small, the question is raised that every time he does something, all the little kids of the daycare just love my little, my little Sean Sean, and they're crazy about him. And then when little Sean Sean get older, the first time a girl does something wrong and hurt little Sean Sean feeling, guess what? Mama up in the front. What does she want? Justice. What does she want? Does she want it now? Mama going to go up to the school and act a fool if little Sean Sean come home crying, right? But when little Sean Sean does something wrong with the little girl, and the little girl calls her mom and says, excuse me, Miss Sean, Miss Sean, Sean, your son did this to me. You know what the mama turns around to do? I ain't in y'all business. I ain't getting into y'all all y'all stuff. So what happens is that it sends a double message. It absolutely sends a double message. So we have to pay attention to that challenge about the way our mothers love their sons. And I actually have restoration recommendations that I give for single mothers around loving those sons and the challenge of it. But guess what? When we reach the point of starting to understand our dating processes, here's the question we got to deal with. We're looking at dating. You're going out more frequently, mating. That's the physical intimacy between individuals. And relating, getting to know an individual. Relating uh, means uh, learning each other, learning about each other, learning about their past relationships and types of friends. These are the relating things. A lot of times, when I'm looking at men who are sitting up there telling me, I'm going to tell you, Dr. White, uh, my baby mama is crazy. And then a woman turn around and telling me, I'm telling you, Dr. White, my child's father is a fool. And then they got together and had a baby, and guess what they produced? A crazy, a crazy fool. fool. You're absolutely right. That's what the teacher got to teach. What? A crazy fool. Right. So we have to begin to do some work. That means that 
You actually, in the relating phase, there's work that you got to do. You are initially attracted to his physical stature. You're initially attracted to her physical stature. But if you don't get past that, everything that you should have known in preconception, you discover in postconception. So we're going to look at that. I asked you, what came first? Dating? Do you date? Do you relate? Or do you mate? Now, a number of you, when we looked at it, you all said, you know what, some of you said we date, mate, relate. Some say we date, relate, mate. Some of you said we mate, mate, mate. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody wrote that on my thing. I didn't put that on there. Just put mate, mate, mate. All right. Well, when we begin to look at raising and try to understand those questions, the consequences that come with them. What happens when you're engaging in the relating phase, you begin to see this concept if you study preconception, postconception. And so when you're looking at this concept of preconception, postconception, you discover things in the postconception that you wish you knew in the preconception. So now you all of a sudden saying that she's crazy. Now you all of a sudden saying that I didn't know he was that violent. So what we begin to understand in that process is that when we're looking, you start to learn, imagine when I tell women, you talk to the sister. What happens to the sister? Well, I could have told you, he didn't, he didn't beat his last five girlfriends. You should have asked him. So we have to begin to understand some of these dynamics as we move through. Understanding the different stages of talking, going on dates, dating exclusively. This is actually what really happens. You talk, and then you start going on dates, and sometimes we get it confused. Just because we go on a date, some folks start thinking they're actually in a relationship. And we, so when we move forward, dating exclusively. And dating exclusively still doesn't mean you're in a relationship. That just means for right now, you're the only person that I'm focusing on. But what happens in the process is that if you're not checking in, where are we at in this relationship? So now you think, because y'all dating exclusively, and she think y'all about to get engaged, those are some problems. And this is where the domestic violence sometimes kick in. She cheating on me. How's she cheating on me? Y'all just dating exclusively. Y'all not in a relationship. So when we move through the process, we learn everything that we need to know about going from the little R in a relationship to the big M, which is a marriage. So a part of ensuring that we are able to make the modern family work, we have to look at the three transformations, the psychological one, when you get engaged. That means understanding the family have to recognize you all are engaged, the friends have to recognize you all are engaged, and it's a formal process. When you engage, this is no longer my girlfriend, my chick, my, my ride or die, all this. It is my fiance. And you have to do that because now you're now training people in the verbal and then even the, uh, the, the, uh, the behavioral. You have to start having those discussions and even a spiritual alignment. These are all the things that are required on the, law, uh, the journey to having a successful marriage. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. But um, how about the government plays in this with like Section 8, uh, you know, child support? The government give single black women that make them harder to get married. Well, you know, it, it, you know, it's a very powerful question, and I've been asked before in terms of child support. And here's a tough one. I, I, I tell people all the time. One of the places that I work, I, I, I tell people I work under one of the worst conditions of Black American life. And here's what I mean by that: where one, where my office is, it is actually under child, the, the, under the child support building. I mean, I'm on the second floor. Child support is on the third floor. And guess what? I don't care how you add it up. Child support system is a system that was created in response to a failure of a family. And it's become an institutionalized response. Now, one of my favorite shows, I don't have time to show it, but one of my favorite shows of all time is a movie called Claudine. Staff starring James Earl John. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And where you have the social worker come out to the house and they have to hide everything. You have to hide the fact that there was a man in the house and all these other values. Well, that's one of the challenges 
when you are uh, when your financial well-being is under the management of the government, sometimes there are values that are placed on the family. But guess what? Again, because child support was created as a result of the breakdown of the family, that means child support as well as the state has some skin in the game. So it is problematic. And that's why I kind of speak sometimes to the work that we have to do. It would be great if a man and a woman could not be together, but he still was able to financially care for his child. And there was a time that was the existence and the reality. But then in 1996, when they came up with the Personal Responsibility Reconciliation Act, what ended up happening is that if you receive any public benefits, you have to waive your right to collect child support. So that meant getting uh, uh, collecting child support for the father now became a mandatory requirement. It didn't matter. If y'all were not married, and you got public benefits, the state said we get to get that money back, period. What's that called now? A Personal Responsibility and Reconciliation Act. So we have to begin to look at this and understand these differences in relationships. So the little R is relationship, the big M is married. In the little R in relationship, your money is your money. But in a marriage, it's your money. A commitment in a relationship, you cheat, you're just cheating. But in a marriage, it's called adultery. There are legal and financial mm -hmm. implications. Y'all yeah. with me? Yes. Yes. What has happened is that we've gotten to the point that we're no longer able to make the distinction between a relationship and a marriage. So if I'm asking the couple, what's the difference between being in a relationship and a marriage? And you really don't know them. That means because they've gotten so blended, but there are differences. So for example, when you have a child born out of wedlock when you are you have a child born out of wedlock, the reality is the father has no rights to the child. Doesn't matter if he signed a birth certificate, doesn't matter if the child has his last name, it doesn't even matter if the child lives with the father. In the state of Georgia, for example, he has no rights to the child. In order for the father, unmarried father, to have any rights to say so to his child, he must do three things. Number one, he must establish paternity. All paternity means is that you are financially responsible for the child. It does not require a DNA test or anything to establish paternity. It just simply means you are financially responsible for the child. The next stage is that you must legitimize or establish a legal relationship between you and the child. The process of making that child legitimate. All legitimation does is allows for the father to inherit from the child, the child to inherit from the father. Legitimation allows for the father, the child to have the father's last name, but even with legitimation, the father still does not have the legal right to be physically involved in the child's life. The only way an unmarried, unmarried father can have the legal right to be physically involved in the child's life is that he must sue the mother. And in his suit, he must identify in Exhibit A the terms of his involvement. Visitation, first, third, fifth weekend of the month, uh, alternating holidays, birthdays. That's what it looks like in an unmarried relationship. Yes, sir? Okay. <laughs> He's been quiet the whole time. Now he's like, oh, hold on. Yeah. Is this the only state, is Georgia like the only state that has laws like this? Georgia, let me clarify something. Georgia is one of the remaining states because legitimation laws go all the way back to slavery. To understand the legitimation, you actually find it in the real estate laws when we were property. And so if a master oh, went down yeah, to that yeah. shed and he slept with that, that black woman and we went down there and slept with that black woman, he had the choice of whether or not he wanted to legitimize or publicly acknowledge that that child was his. If he did so, that child was legitimated. So Georgia has not changed that law. So in many other states, other than maybe two others, many other states, those things are the exact same thing. I need you to spell legitimation. L-E-G, <laughs> legitimate L-E-G, I-M-I. Okay, I can't I can't have two people spelling it. I know, legitimation. Right? Sound like a rap group, don't it? I know, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for legitimation. Legitimate L-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-G-R-T-E-
And so this is what I'm going to leave you with. Some seven elements that I'm going to tell you for a successful relationship and a successful marriage. And the first one when we move to that is the seven keys is love. Genuine love for each other and not each other's things. The first lesson, genuine love for each other and not each other's things. If you've fallen in love with his things, then he can lose those things and you can fall out of love. Absolutely. Number two, <laughs> being evenly yoked. Here, I don't mean not so much educational finance, but similar values and beliefs. You've got to understand whether or not you, have, you share similar values and beliefs. And that's why we did that value exercise. You've got to understand the values. Do you share similar values? Number three, understanding. It requires an understanding of your partner's position and not projecting your beliefs or value on your partner's position. What that looks like is we act like I already know what your issue is. So I, you already have these issues, and I'm going to conclude what those issues are. So that means that you have to learn to listen. And so what we do in that regard is that I have to demonstrate for you first that I understand and then disagree. We actually get confused. A lot of times we start disagreeing and we fail to demonstrate that we first understand. And a lot of times the greatest challenges in relationships is a failure to understand. Right? That means we're so quick to state our position without obtaining understanding. But if I can demonstrate to you that I understand, and we both agree that I understand, and then I say, now I disagree. And so that's why we push for the need for understanding. Number three, commitment. Wedding vows are real. Yeah. Yep. For rich, for poor, and sickness and health, these are really phases, believe it or not, in a relationship. There are ebbs yep. and there are flows. Well, in a relationship. And so the commitment is understanding that I'm going to be with you when we both got two jobs and the income is great, but I'm going to be getting with you. And that's what you understood about good times and the other shows, is that you understood even in poverty, we spoke to the ebbs and flows in the relationship. So we talk about commitment. Managing crisis. I tell people one of the greatest measurements of the strength of a relationship is how you behave and in crisis. And here's what I mean. You have to understand how you were raised in dealing with crises. So for some people in relationships, when there's a crisis, some people growing up were taught, you know what, I, I'll handle myself, I don't need, and I'm going to be in isolation to manage the crisis. While other people, when a crisis happens, the whole family comes together. Now what happens if you didn't understand each other's values and a crisis takes place, now you want to be by yourself and your partner wants to come together and hug, you have a conflict. So that's why it becomes important for you to really, really understand how you all handle crisis. We're talking about re relating, dating, and mating. These are the things you obtain in the relating phase of the relationship. Because if this is way out, and you all have fallen in love with all those physical attributes and you didn't get that, you had a problem. So that's one of our seven keys. Number one, number two, tolerance. You must have the ability to tolerate each other's differences. Now, when y'all first started dating, it would be so cute. Your, 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 your wife and your girlfriend say, oh, this is so cute. He left his dirty drawers on the floor. I'm going to pick him up. Poop, and you throw him away. It's all beautiful. <laughs> and then five, six, seven years ago, this Negro and left his drawers on the floor again. I ain't picking him up. And you come all the way home. Hey, how you doing? You left the drawers in the bathroom floor. Come pick them up. So there becomes some work. <laughs> so there's some work around the tolerance. Work around the tolerance in the relationship. And that's what that image projects. As well as being spiritual. You have to understand spirituality where each of you are. Is there a shared belief? Here you are dating a Baptist preacher's daughter. And you could be an atheist. Now, <laughs> guess what? That would be interesting. That could be amazing. Now, imagine she looking and saying, this is the finest atheist I've ever met in my whole life. That brother got it going on. That is just one fine a atheist. And you try to bring that fine atheist home to your Baptist daddy. Y'all ain't even going to yoke. And he's going to have problems getting out the door in one. You, you see what I mean? So we have to understand those pieces which are real. <laughs> so when we begin the journey of marriage and relationships and restoring and strengthening 
in making the Marvin family work, I'm telling you that in the journey of a relationship, all these things are going to speak to us. Love is going to speak to us in that journey. You keep on moving, you're going to also see being evenly yoked. These are all those seven keys when they start to play out in our relationships, commitment. We see these things kicking out, managing crisis. These are all the pieces, I'm telling you, in your relationships and even what you educate your children on. I'm telling you, all these things are critical in your journey, understanding. So you want to work hard to try to integrate these important pieces, even spirituality, integrating them in your journey. So as I move toward the closing of this, I want to make sure that you all understand that the work that has to happen when we fail to do what's needed to strengthen the black family, I'm telling you that our children become impacted. And they see that what we have to communicate to understand our children. We have to understand that not everybody's going to be together, but the children still need to know that you're still a family. Here's what happens when I'm working with a divorced couple or a separated couple. They're saying we're no longer together, we're no longer family. But if I ask a child, if I ask the mother, well, are you and the, the, the father and the child? No, we ain't a family anymore. If I ask the dad, are y'all still family? She says, no, we're still a family, no longer family. But if I ask the child, the child says, this is my mama, this is my daddy, this is my family. But what happens when people divorce, the adults in their mind have said, we're no longer a family. And when you do that as an adult, say you're no longer a family, what you've actually done is denied the child the ability to say, I got a family. So in our journey in the closeout, we have to understand everything that we communicate to our children. On all sides. <laughs> Even the men, we have to take a look at it. It's because if we don't, what we communicate goes from generation to generation. So the dad gets ready to leave and the mother sits there and she says, I don't need a man. And then her daughter says, huh, I don't want a man. And then that little child says, huh, and I don't want to be a man. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We see that center of focus there. This is what our challenge is, men, and our restoration and making the modern family work. This is what our challenges are to build and strengthen the family, to close out. We have to do the work that's important to connecting and understanding the black family. I'm going to leave you all, um, I'm going to leave you all with um, a piece that I wrote. I'm a poet, and so I'm going to leave you all with a piece that I've written. It's called Black Child Running Wild. And I want you to think about this uh, piece, Black Child Running Wild. When I say Black Child Running Wild, then I need the women to say, you better get back home then I need the men to say, where you belong. So when I say black child running wild, women say, you better get back home where you belong. You got it? Let's try. And I need your rhythm. So when I say black child running wild, you better get back home where you belong. I said black child running wild. Where you belong. Look my legs. I said black child. Running wild. You better get back home. Where you belong. Now mama said to her son, Johnny, come straight home. After school, lock the door, never answer the phone. Mama worked three jobs and always came home late. Ever since he was five, fixed his own plate. One day the drug boys made an offer Johnny couldn't refuse. Two hundred dollars a week he knew his family could use to keep both eyes open for the men in blue. Well, the money got good, and Johnny made lots of friends. And six months later, he was in like Flynn. Now he's wearing new shoes and got no time for school. Till on the cover, picked him up, and now he's singing Juvie Blues, because he's a black child running wild. You better get back home where you belong. Now little Tina had a secret that she just couldn't keep about her loss of innocence with Uncle Pete. He was Mama's boyfriend, and she loved him to death. Always offering money and giving them help. But Tina knew that Uncle Pete could keep his hands to himself. Now she's 16 years old, her stomach grows and grows, and Mama's swearing up and down that she did not know, because he's a black child running wild. You better get back home where you belong. Now little Dave was a boy who loved his daddy like a toy. The only hero he knew, a superman without a suit, until one day, I don't know where daddy up the 
Well, Mama stayed strong and took little Dave and moved on, but she knew deep down that there was something really wrong. Now, Player Dave is a teen, and Daddy's back on the scene, telling him how to live his life and not to be so mean. They said, you left me in two when I reached my arms out for you. I could not find you at five to wipe the tears from my eyes. Then again, at the age of 10, I needed you to be my friend. Now that the cub was a Lion King, you want to do the father-son thing? So with disgrace in his face, they just turned and walked away to be a black child running wild. You better get back home where you belong. It takes a village to raise a child I heard somewhere. Not if the child don't listen and the village don't care altogether about the black child running wild.